Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming out with the uh, rain. First, I want to thank uh, the Sydney Writers' Festival for bringing me here, and I want to thank Hardy Grant, and I also want to thank the Canadian government for funding this trip, which is pretty fantastic of them. I uh, certainly never thought that would happen. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to tell you guys the story of the last year of my life and how, how this all happened, how this went from being a joke with a friend of mine to a New York Times bestselling book and now here. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the implications of what I wrote. And this is where I, I try to sound smart, and uh, it's not going to last very long, trust me. So I'm going to begin. Usually I have a... So I used to teach public speaking in Indiana, and usually I have a chalkboard or like a whiteboard. So I usually like to write this thing down. So January 18th, 2008. I like to write that down on a board. Mentally, everyone right now, just remember that in your head. January 18th, 2008. This is going to be important as I go along. Uh, so my friend Miles and I are having an instant messenger conversation. Now, a few things about Miles. Miles and I went to high school together in Toronto, and Miles is Filipino. This is relevant for one very specific reason. Post number 11 in the book is Asian Girls, and that was written by Miles, a Filipino, Valentine, not me. So if anyone came here to stab me, it was not, it's not a good idea. So we're having an instant messenger conversation. Uh, I'm in Los Angeles, and Miles is in Vancouver. And we're talking about the TV show The Wire. We're both enormous fans of the show. And Miles says, I don't trust any white person who doesn't watch The Wire. <laughs> Perfectly reasonable thing to say. I mean, I didn't challenge him. And then so we, we started talking. We said, well, what are they doing? What are they doing instead of watching The Wire? And this is how instant messaging conversations go. We started throwing things back and forth. And we said, oh, they're doing yoga. They're going to therapy. <laughs> they're getting divorced. <laughs> And it was that one. It was that exact thing. The idea that a white person was too busy getting divorced again to watch The Wire, where I said, all right, that's it. It's blog time. Those are my exact words. It's blog time. And I went to WordPress.com, where literally, literally millions of people sign up to write crappy blogs every single day. <laughs> and I just typed in stuff white people like .wordpress.com. There was no focus group. There was no thinking about it. I'm like, what is this, what is this site going to be about? Stuff white people like. And there it was. So I, I entered it in to WordPress, and I started writing. And I like to say that I was either motivated by extreme self-loathing or outward loathing to white people, but I couldn't stop writing. As soon as I started, the first one I put in was coffee. No particular reason. I just remembered in high school that guys... The first guy to start drinking coffee was always a white guy. And you knew he didn't enjoy it. But he kept a cup attached to his backpack. And every single year, there'd be a new one to it. And it was always a white guy. And, uh, and then from there, more and more stuff started coming out. So again, January 18th. I think we wrote five posts that day. And every day, I just had more and more ideas. More and more stuff had to come out. So by about January 28th, I'm up to 25 entries. And I think, OK, this is, this is actually pretty funny stuff. I'm going to send this to all of my friends. I have about 25 friends total. <laughs> That's, that, that even, I, I'm even pushing it. And I want to stress that these 25 friends are not powerful friends. These are PhD students. These are unemployed people in Toronto. These are not a powerful 25. So I send it to them. And I say, hey, check out this new site I'm, working, I'm, I'm doing. I think it's pretty funny. And an amazing thing happened was they started sending it on to their friends. I didn't ask them to send it on to their friends. They sent it on to their friends. And then they were sending me these email chains they were getting back from all of their friends saying what was missing or how racist this list was. <laughs> either way, either they thought it was hilarious or they thought it was racist, but they were forwarding it on again. So I noticed that traffic had started to spike. And in the early days of the site, all the traffic was pretty much misguided searches for organic fair trade coffee. <laughs> And actually, to this day, I still get people saying, like, I was looking for a KitchenAid mixer, and I found your stupid racist website. This is horrible. Um, but now what was happening was people were actually looking for this site, and we were getting direct traffic coming in from these email forwards. And so I told my friend Max, I was working as a copywriter at an interactive agency in Los Angeles. This is part of the fairy tale. Um, and the guy next to me was an account executive, and he said, man, you need to put ads on that site. You could make, like, 60 bucks a month. And I'm like, man, that's dinner. That's awesome. Oh, I right, totally. 
So I go, um, I go to register the domains. I register stuffwhitepeoplelike.com, and because I'm a natural-born smartass, I registered stuffwhitepeoplelike.org too, because .org is the non like you use it for nonprofits, and so I want people to think we were a nonprofit organization for the study of white people. <laughs> but for the record, we are a for-profit organization for the study of white people. And so I registered the two domains, and I started hosting the site on um, just a regular you know, hosting service. That same day, the blog was linked to from Comedy Central, which is like America's main comedy channel. They're the one that launched the Dave Chappelle show and South Park, so they're pretty powerful. It was linked to from their blog and Good Magazine, which is Al Gore's son's magazine, and their blog on that day. Traffic spikes... We're talking again, maybe February 2nd or February 3rd. Traffic spikes from about 1,000 to 30,000 hits. And of course, it crashes the site. <laughs> and I'm freaking out. I'm like, oh my God, this is the biggest thing that's ever happened to me, and this site is, is not working. So I have to call up uh, the hosting company, and I go, uh, what's, what's going on? Why is my site down? And he goes, oh man, you totally violated the terms of service. And I go, what, why? What did I do? He goes, you used way too much bandwidth. And I go, what? What? And he goes, when, what, are you, what are you running here? Some sort of e-commerce site? And I go, N no. And he goes, I was just a blog. And there's a pause on the other end of the line. And he goes, is this, uh, is this an, uh, an adult blog? <laughs> and I feel like I'm like, no, it's just like me writing about white people with stock photos. And he's like, no, no, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you really doing here? So I had to move the site back to WordPress, which meant no ads, meant no $60. Uh, <laughs> But I was sort of saying, I was like, you know what, I'll trade the margin, what I thought was going to be like a marginal blip for the 60 bucks because it was really fun. But then every day it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And people were forwarding it on to their friends and their friends and their friends. And I started doing uh, traditional press interviews. So with the LA Times, New York Times, Houston Chronicle, Baltimore Sun. And all of these new media reporters would always say to me, and say, look for a huge spike in traffic. And it never happened. Because the biggest spike in traffic came from StumbleUpon or like other people's blogs or incoming links from instant messenger conversations. Traditional media, even though it was helping, was not the main source of traffic to the blog. So it just kept getting bigger and bigger. I was being interviewed on NPR, um, which is you know public radio for the United States. And then in the middle of February, I got an email because there was always an email address to the site, stuff white people like at gmail.com, where all the hate mail goes. And I got an email from a literary agent in New York City saying, we want to turn your blog into a book. And I'm floored. This has been a lifelong dream. Now, I'd spent the previous four years in academia, and so I'd always wanted to write a book, but this was my chance to write a book that people were actually going to read, <laughs> which is beyond the dreams of any academic. <laughs> and so, so we're talking February 16th, okay? So literally a month after I started this site, literary agents in New York City are reaching out to me to turn this into a book. It's incredible, and the traffic keeps growing every single day. Now we're up at around 250,000 hits a day. So, still in February. We get a little further into February. Traffic keeps going up. 600,000 hits a day. And now this is where it gets interesting. So more and more press. I'm doing... Oh, I'm crap at my job at this point, by the way. I spend all day on the phone doing radio interviews, sending email interviews back and forth, all these press outlets. Like, I am, like, I should have been fired well, well earlier than I was. <laughs> and then an interesting thing happened. So I live in Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, there are five major talent agencies that rep every celebrity you've ever heard of. The big one is CAA, then there's UTA, William Morris, Endeavor, and ICM. February 26, I got calls from four of the five saying they want me to be their client. Now, in L.A., getting one of these agencies to represent you is an enormous deal. It is a huge deal. So I take a day off work, March 1st. And here's the interesting part. Uh, so I live in Los Angeles, and um, I ride a bicycle to get around the city. For any of you who have been to L.A., this would be the equivalent of... I can't even imagine living in Manly and swimming to Sydney every single day. <laughs> it is just not done. So I took a day off, and I biked from Culver City to Beverly Hills to meet with these talent agents. So you've got to remember, this, these are the talent agencies where, you know, celebrities pull up in Hummers and G-Wagons and all that stuff, and here I come on my fixed-gear bicycle. Big surprise, right, to anyone who knows what that is. 
So first one I go to is CAA. This is the biggest, scariest talent agency in the world. Their building is nicknamed the Death Star. This is not a joke. And they have a long, circular driveway. And they're actually located on a street called Avenue of the Stars. Totally without irony. They really mean it. <laughs> and so it's this big, circular driveway. And I pull up on my bike. And I am weaving between Bentleys and Hummers and like super expensive Beamers. And I am petrified I'm going to scratch one. Because I have no money at this point, right? I'm like, oh my god, please don't let me scratch one of these cars. I get through the parking lot, no problem. I get to the front door, and I bring my bike in. And apparently, if you have marble floors, security guards get really pissed when bike tires touch them. So the security guard comes flying in and goes, get that goddamn bike off the floor, on your shoulder now. So I'm already freaked out, right? And I have my bike on my shoulder, and I get up to the front desk. <laughs> and the secretary, or sorry, the receptionist looks at me and goes, Courier deliveries are in the back. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, I'm, I'm actually here for a meeting. Like, oh, you're that guy, right? Because like, I, cause I, I told the assistant, they're like, here are the valet instructions. And I go, I don't think I'm going to be needing those. But it does remain my dream in Los Angeles to valet my bicycle just once. <laughs> I always dream of getting up there and then just throwing the keys to him and saying, don't scratch it, asshole. <laughs> I haven't yet. I can't do it. So I met with CAA, normal meeting, and I leave, and then I go bike over to William Morris. Um, the other two meetings I had at UTA and Endeavor were fairly uneventful. The William Morris one was pretty eventful, at least for me. So William Morris, not quite as intimidating as CAA. They have a very simple um, setup. Let me try and do this here. So when you, come into William, when you come into William Morris, there's a main receptionist desk that's manned by sort of this famous German woman. And everyone in Hollywood knows who she is because everyone who comes in there has to deal with her. And then away from her, there are like three or four chairs, like a waiting area set up. So I'd naturally come into William Morris with my bike because believe it or not, there's like no place to lock it up. You think more people will be biking to work, right? <laughs> and so I bring my bike into William Morris and I don't have a kickstand. I'm trying to get my helmet off into my backpack and my bike is falling over and I look like, I look like an idiot. And over there in those three seats are three dudes, three obvious actor dudes, because they have uh, sort of like fancy European sneakers, pre-faded jeans, uh, an Ed Hardy t-shirt, and a sports coat. They also have, uh, so like I'm pretty into my beard, like I talk about this a lot, and like I, don't, I have no book deals without a beard and one with, so it's a source of all my power, but... <laughs> But I can't, I can't connect down here. You see, like, nothing grows here. It's like, it's like it was raised by a Civil War general or something, but it doesn't, it doesn't connect. So I'm always, like, checking out other guys' beards just to see, like, how it's going. And these guys, all three of them, oh, it's like Don Johnson, like, perfect, perfect stubble. Everything filled in all the way around. I don't know what razor they were using, but it was like, like a perfect two millimeter stubble all the way around. And they had that amazing hair that looks wet and messy, but perfect at the same time. <laughs> and I could just tell from their legs, they were all over six feet tall. And guys over six feet tall are my mortal enemy. <laughs> because I've had a pretty amazing life so far. I, I, I'm not really complaining, but if I was three inches taller, it would be 60% better. This is, this is science, and I believe in this. So they were all taller than me, better looking than me, better beards than me. And when they saw me with this fumbling bike, they just looked at me with such disgust. They were just like... So anyways, I get my bike put away, and I sit down. I'm trying not to squish the mic here. And I sit down like this. And of course, I'm kind of sweaty because I've been biking. And I'm so nervous. I'm just all excited. I'm like, oh my God, I'm in William Morris offices. And I look over at the guys, and I go, what's up? <laughs> what else am I going to do, right? And they give me one of these right back to each other. They didn't, even, they didn't even acknowledge I was alive. And I was like, this is a great start. This is a good start to this career. I feel fantastic. So I want to remind you, they were there when I pulled up in my bike. They were there when I sat down. Then an assistant comes down. Now remember, the power is a big deal in Hollywood, and sometimes it's really tiny. Assistant comes down and says, uh, Christian, come with me. Now, what that meant was, they came down to get me first. First. And in Hollywood, that means I'm more important than these three jerks. It was one of the biggest achievements of my life. 
It was like slam dunking on all three of them at once and breaking the backboard, having it highlights everywhere. It was, I felt like such a champion that day. You take your victories where you can get them, right? And so I got called up, and again, 1st of March, reminding you, January 18th, 2008, I started this blog. March 1st, I'm in William Morris, totally punking off three tall dudes with perfect hair. So I eventually signed with William Morris, and, um, and then March, traffic keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So William Morris takes out the book to New York publishers, and there's an auction for the rights to the book. Can't say, I can't talk about money, that's the only thing Random House said I can't talk about. In any case, the book deal's in place by March 31st, which is the day I quit my job. <laughs> so that's the fairy tale part of it, right? So it was really amazing during that month the site was getting sent all around my company by people who didn't know me. And so they were sending it, and the guy's like, yeah, the guy who writes that works here. And they were like, no, no way. And so when I left, it wasn't, I mean, I liked my company. It was a really great company. It wasn't like I left and, you know, I gave everyone the finger and I said, you know, see you later, losers. It was a really, really nice departure. So I left on March 31st. March 31st, a little over two months after this idea that I only thought four people were going to read I quit the job. So then Random House generously gave me 30 days to write the second half of the book, <laughs> which was no problem. I mean, again, I'd been in I dropped out of graduate school, so this was like the easiest writing. I'm like, no footnotes? Awesome, no problem. <laughs> no Foucault? Oh, I could do this, no worries. Um, so I finished it. I handed in the rough manuscript on April 1st. Sorry, on May 1st. Then spent the month of May going back and forth working on the diagrams and all the grammar and all the edits and stuff like that. Uh, handed in the final approved manuscript on June 1st. The book was published on July 1st. The book was on the New York Times bestseller list on July 14th. So let me recap these dates for you one more time. <laughs> January 18th, I start this blog as a joke. March, I get to do the William Morris thing, which is great. July 1st, it's published. July 14th, it's a New York Times bestseller. Six months from idea to bestseller list. And that's how it happened. And that no connections. I mean, I'm very aware that I'm the luckiest guy on earth. And so the book was doing really well. Got to go out on tour. Had a great time. Then in August, things got really interesting. Uh, my publicist at Random House got a call from the Conan O'Brien show saying, we'd like to have you on. Now, this is a huge deal for me, right? Like, I love Conan O'Brien. I've been watching this show forever. He's got red hair. He knows the pain. And, uh, and so it's all booked. September 6th, 2008. I'm booked on the Conan O'Brien show. So I did what every one of you would do as soon as you found that out. I went to the Conan O'Brien website and I hit refresh every two seconds to find out who the other guests were going to be. Because <laughs> it was a Friday show, right? So I thought it could be anybody, like some big superstar. So refresh, 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 refresh. Keep looking. Refresh, refresh, refresh. Finally, it comes up. Jerry O'Connell. Do you guys know who Jerry O'Connell is? He made a movie called Kangaroo Jack. It was set in Australia. I thought all you guys would know who he was, right? Sort of ridiculous if you don't. He was also the fat kid in Stand By Me. His life turned out just fine, don't worry. Um, and now, growing up in Canada, he was on a Canadian TV show called My Secret Identity. I don't know if it made its way down here. It was not a very good show. Uh, he was a teenager who had superpowers that, as far as I could tell, were running really, really fast and being able to fly if he sprayed two aerosol cans downward. <laughs> you have to love government-subsidized television. <laughs> it creates some wonderful stuff. And so I watched that show when I was a kid, and I loved it. And like I said before, he was the fat kid in Stand By Me. And I was a fat kid. And he gives every fat kid hope. It's like, you can look like this at 12 and this at 22. Like... He's lived the dream. And so I was so excited. And I love the show Sliders. And I was like, man, I can't believe I'm going to get to meet Jerry O'Connell. And I start thinking, I'm like, well, what am I going to do, really? Like, am I going to go to his dressing room and be like, hey, uh, remember when you were fat? <laughs> like, I'm so nervous. I'm going to look like some sort of jerk, right? I can't be like, uh, that sucked. And then you, now you look awesome. Like, yeah. Like, I can't do that. I can't be that guy. So... And then the other guest was a Tim Gunn from Project Runway. I don't know if you guys watch that show. Uh, it drives me nuts. I usually go to a, a lot of the talks. People are more impressed by the Tim Gunn thing than the Jerry O'Connell thing. And I lose it. Like, I'll flip tables over because I will defend Jerry O'Connell's career. And so, so anyway, so that's who's going to be on the show. And I'm like, 
I'm thinking, I'm like, what am I going to do? How am I going to approach Jerry? How am I going to tell him I'm a fan? What am I going to do? I don't know. So I get to New York, and when you're the third guest on Conan O'Brien, your dressing room is as big as this table. No, it was awesome. I was not complaining. I was so happy to be in there. It was fantastic. And so I'm in there. There's an unopened plate of cookies, because I know if I eat them, I'll throw up. And also in there with me is, is one of my agents, who looks like me, but he's about five feet tall. Anyone want to guess why I signed with William Morris? I know I could trust him. And possibly dunk on him. Um, but he has no beard. So anyways, so I'm just sitting in there, trying to stay calm, trying not to freak out. Knock on my door. It's Jerry fucking O'Connell. And he looks at my agent. He goes, are you the guy? Are you the stuff white people like guy? My agent goes, and points at me. And Jerry just starts gushing. He's going crazy. He's like, oh my God, it's the funniest sight. I read it all the time. Oh, it's so incredible. And I'm trying to get a word in. I'm like, Jerry, you were great. And he's like, oh, it's so funny. The one you had on scarves. It was so great. So I'm like, Jerry, you were so good. And he's like, it was so funny. It was so funny. He's like, man, that was awesome. Now look, I need you to stick around after the show. I got some people you want to meet. I got to go out there and do this thing, right? So what does he do? He goes out on the stage. He does what Jerry O'Connell does. He rips it. He's hilarious. He's so funny. He's making fun of his wife. And uh, it's awesome. It's really funny. So then Tim Gunn goes out there, and I'm like, whatever I tell you from here on is video evidence, because I don't remember any of this happening. I completely blacked out the whole time I was up there, because this was like such a dream come true. So oh, I go out on stage. Uh, I think I was wearing like the exact same shit I'm wearing right now. <laughs> um, anyway, so I go out on stage, and now it's important for the setup. So Conan would be like right here, you know, in his Conan chair, and then I'm here, Tim Gunn's here, and Jerry O'Connell's here. So as the interview's going along, Conan and I are talking about red hair, it's going really well, farmer's markets, it's really funny. And then since Tim Gunn's a fashion guy, Conan goes, well, what are some clothes white people like? And Jerry O'Connell reaches over Tim Gunn and starts pinching my sweater, right? So that I'll say sweaters. But I, all I can see is Jerry O'Connell is pinching me. And I have no idea why. So I just, there's a video of me looking at him like this. And then looking back at Conan and being like, uh, t-shirts? <laughs> and as I'm doing the interview, everything I say is killing Jerry O'Connell. It's like Tim Gunn's doing the polite laughter thing, like, yes, <laughs> that is true. White people do like scarves. <laughs> and, uh, but Jerry is like clutching his stomach and like half falling off the couch. He's like, oh, oh my God, oh my God, it's so funny. And then it, it, it finally ends and, uh, I have this photo of Conan, like me with Conan, and he's laughing, and my book's on the table, and I still can't believe it happened. So, so the show ends, and I go backstage, and Jerry O'Connell's there. He's like, hey, that was awesome. Here's the people I want you to meet. It's my parents. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It was literally his parents. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm there, and his parents... They're from New York City. And you know how like, every architect or magazine editor has like, the most ridiculous glasses you'll ever see in the world? Both of his parents had that. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, and we're talking about Toronto and where they were living when they were filming the show. In the back of my head, I'm thinking, is this, am I really backstage at Conan O'Brien <laughs> talking to Jerry O'Connell's parents? So then Jerry O'Connell comes up after I've talked to his parents for a while, and I guess made a connection. And he comes up to me and goes, Yo, let me get your email address. When we get back to L.A., we'll all go out to dinner. Now, I'm thinking for a second here. This dinner's never going to happen. Here's why. Jerry O'Connell is married to Rebecca Romaine. Do you know who that is? The swimsuit model? She's about six feet tall, tan. Jerry O'Connell's like 6'2", tan. They both have perfect hair. And I'm married. And my wife, she's very cute. She's beautiful. But she's, she's like this tall. And she's pale and has sort of reddish hair. And so I'm thinking, if we go out to dinner with Jerry O'Connell and Rebecca Romaine... There might be paparazzi there. Not for me, but for them. And I could never recover if the caption underneath said, Jerry O'Connell and Rebecca Romaine participate in the couple's edition of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> because compared to these two, we look like mole people, you know? Like, so I knew this dinner was never going to happen. And it, 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 it doesn't happen. There's no happy ending to that story. So anyway, so then later... Um, about two weeks later, I go on the Carson Daly Show, which airs at 2.30 in the morning uh, every day of the week. Pretty impressive, right? <laughs> Just to give you an idea of the caliber of this show, I was the headlining guest for this episode. <laughs> 
Anyways, so uh, this one films in L.A. So when they said, oh, we'll send a car to pick you up. Do you have any special demands? And I'm joking. I'm like, yeah, it has to be a hybrid. And they actually sent a hybrid, <laughs> like a big-ass SUV hybrid. And I was like, I, I was kidding, but this is nice. And uh, so anyway, so I'm in the dressing room there. And I guess when you're first guest on Carson Daly, the dressing room gets bigger. There was a bathroom. There's a gift basket. It was crazy. But on the wall is a picture of Jerry O'Connell singing like this. It's like... And Jess, as my wife goes, you have to email him. You will never find a less awkward situation in which to email Jerry O'Connell. So I'm like, okay, fine. So I have like a little Blackberry type thing. And I typed Jerry O'Connell like, hey, Jerry, um, I'm going to be on Carson Daly tonight. And I thought it was really funny. There's a picture of you in the dressing room. Send. Beep. Email Jerry O'Connell. Awesome. I'm TiVoing it right now. What is going on? I, like, I couldn't believe this is really happening. And in the last chapter to this, it gets weirder.